Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, so hello and greetings to you all. Um, as I said, this is the eighth ISAD webinar in the series. Um, as a reminder, these webinars are, are designed to help you unpack social change for conservation, the World Zoo and Aquarium Conservation Education Strategy. And it's been specifically created by the ISAD board to provide support and training for you um, on this new conservation education strategy. So this is the last in the series and it covers the last chapter, chapter eight. And the title of that chapter is Strengthening the Evidence of the Conservation Education Value of Zoos and Aquariums. I'm Dr. Sarah Thomas. I'm the Head of Conservation Advocacy and Engagement at Auckland Zoo in New Zealand. I'll be your host and your moderator for today's webinar. And Kim, who's in uh, St. Louis, she's going to be our tech um, help and supervisor for today. So we have four, uh, uh, three fantastic speakers today. Um, we have Nettie Pletcher from Bees Knees Creative in uh, USA. We have Dr. Monet Vebecki from the Institute of Learning Innovation, um, also in the USA. And we also have uh, Dr. Andy Moss, who's based in the UK uh, at Chester Zoo. So some housekeeping before we get going. Um, as always, um, we'll start with this housekeeping notice. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded um, and that recording will be posted on the IZD YouTube channel. So by staying and participating, you're consenting to being part of this recording. And always hello to all the viewers who are watching this later on the IZD YouTube channel. As I know, if you've missed any of the previous webinars, you can find those um, all listed now on that YouTube channel. Um, as this is a webinar, all the viewers will be on mute, but we do have a, a Q&A box. We have the chat box. So if you've got any comments, any questions, if you want to tell our speakers to slow down a bit, do let us know because it is designed to be an interactive session. So we're going to start off with some polls. So hopefully, Kim, who's our tech supervisor, you can see the first poll. Um, we've got two questions. The first one is asking for you to choose your ISAD membership level. So you've got some choices of institutional member, individual member, associate member, or not an ISAD member. So have a, a think and pick one of those. And then how did you hear about this webinar? So was that through social media, through the website, email, uh, from my regional representative or from a colleague? So we just want you to kind of um, click on those two questions. And Kim, once we've got a good response rate, um, let's see what we've got. Okay, I'm going to close the polls in five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. So let's have a look. Hopefully, um, those watching live can see the results. Um, so we can see we've got 25% institutional members, 25% individual members, but we also have 44% of you that are not an ISAD member. So really welcome to you uh, and hope you find this webinar um, really useful. Um, the ISAD social media um, and the emails um, both had 38% and they were the, the way that most of you heard about um, this webinar. So thanks, Kim, for that. Um, so moving on, um, we are um, eight, eight webinars in the series. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in terms of um, we've gone from, I think it, we started in March and we've got all the way through the year. Um, we are now thinking about the, the recommendations for um, uh, the, the next kind of um, series. Oh, before we get to that, sorry, Kim, there's two polls in this series. Um, you'll see that the second poll has come up and we're wanting to ask you where you're at uh, with implementing um, the conservation education strategy. So for those that are you, watching at home, you won't be able to see this poll right now. So I'll just read the responses. So you've read the document, but nothing else. Uh, you've watched previous uh, chapter webinars and they were really helpful. Uh, you've had conversations with colleagues about how we could implement uh, the conservation education strategy, uh, or your organization is starting to make a plan to implement changes to meet these recommendations, or you're not sure. So again, have a we think about that and then um, decide which one um, you would like to identify with, and then we'll uh, see where we're at. All right, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, Three, two, one. Okay, so hopefully again, those watching live will be able to see the responses. And we've got a really interesting split between those, uh, those categories. So 
Um, we've got some that uh, have read the document, but nothing else. But we also have um, quite a few of you that are starting to make that, those changes. So one of the functions of these webinars was to really get you on those first steps to start having conversations and starting making changes within your organization. So just moving to the next slide that I've got, which is a reminder that if you've not read the, the document or you want to read it in, a, in your own language, we do actually have some uh, new translations um, that are being put up onto the website. If you're sat there thinking, I'd like to translate that into my own language, please do get in contact. We're always looking for other people to um, do translations for us. So we have a number of different languages um, of the strategy. And then just before we get to our first speaker, I'll just remind you of the, the recommendations. So there is four recommendations um, in this chapter. Um, you'll see that I've highlighted in bold what I think is the, the main themes of each recommendation. You'll see the first two cover um, a recommendation to collect and share a range of evidence at multiple stages using multiple methods. And this really it says to me, it's an acknowledgement that there really isn't one way to evaluate a program, evaluate conservation education within zoos and aquariums. And that's really trying to kind of help people think about what are the different ways we can collect evidence? What are the different methods? and what are the different stages we can do it at. The last two you can see, um, I think are a bit more aspirational. Uh, the third one covers a recommendation that zoos and aquariums should conduct evidence-based research that demonstrates the effects of their conservation education on how people think, feel, and act towards the natural world. And the last recommendation ties to that, and that's about partnerships. And it highlights that really there isn't an expectation for zoos and aquariums themselves to do all the work, um, but by building relationships with academic institutions, with other external stakeholders and experts, you'll be able to kind of think about um, research and evaluation with those partners and be able to do it collectively. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to our um, first presentation. Um, our first speaker is uh, Nettie Pletcher. Uh, Nettie is a conservation education lead leadership consultant with Bees Knees Creative. Uh, which is based in San Diego, California, and she's a partner with Pathways Collaborative. And she also serves on the ISD board as our administrator and is often seen as our technical support for these webinars. So I'll just stop sharing and then hopefully, Nettie, over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, we are here today to really talk about this idea of strengthening the evidence that zoos and aquariums have real value when it comes to conservation education. Um, but the buzzwords that are normally used to describe this, this process of providing the evidence or, or measuring that value, you know, we've got things like assessment and KPIs and surveys. And if right now this slide is making you really stressed out, uh, first of all, I apologize for adding more stress to your lives at this time. Um, it'll go away soon. Uh, but my hope is, is that in the next 10 minutes, I can help alleviate some of those negative feelings that you might have towards evaluation. Because as a consultant for zoos and aquariums, I am often involved in doing evaluation. Um, I evaluate program outcomes to help determine you know, what aspects are, are most effective and to what extent do guests really take away what we intend for them to learn. Um, I do exhibit evaluation, um, starting with front-end evaluation studies, looking at what are we gonna include in a new space, um, formative where we're testing different prototypes of interactives or summative assessments after the exhibit's installed, you know, really understanding what the visitors learn there. Um, and as part of my work, you know, I'm, I'm doing some of the words on the screen here, I'm doing interviews, I'm doing focus groups or online surveys and embedded assessments. So all of these evaluation projects that I do or can talk about might give the impression that I am, you know, this, this massive evaluation enthusiast and statistics geek, um, when in fact, I, I also find a lot of this jargon sometimes just as bothersome as maybe the next zoo educator might. But what I have learned is that I can view evaluation or any of these words as a gift. Um, it allows us to design strategies that are fun and interesting and provide actual answers to questions that we have so that we can do conservation education better. Let's get rid of those words. The fact that I think an entire chapter of the Con Ed strategy 
is devoted to this topic of evaluation lets you know that it really is a must have, right? It's not a want to have or nice to have in conservation education. And I know that evaluation often feels like something extra you know, that you're required to do either to secure grant funding um, or complete some kind of year end report for your supervisor who may or may not have time to read your report um, or, or to present the results of a program to a stakeholder and basically end up telling them what you're pretty sure you knew at the very beginning before you even bothered with all of this, this evaluation nonsense. That All that stuff is evaluation at its least useful. It is not how you or I should be spending our time or resources. It's really a disservice to the word evaluation. Please don't do that. So how can we really ensure that the time and the effort that we are putting into evaluation is not a waste of these resources? How can we use evaluation to really demonstrate that zoos and aquariums are important to this field of conservation education and really important to the lives of the millions of people who visit? Here's what I want to offer you, a different way to think about evaluation. Again, was we're trying to understand something and, and, and in our case, it's our visitors, right? We wanna understand them better. And to, we should be pretty excited that there are lots of tools we can use to get inside uh, our visitors' heads a little bit and, and understand what it is that they know and feel and do in response to the programs and exhibits and animal experiences that, that we offer. Um, so don't think about it as this extra burden. It's a gift, right? We can incorporate it into our regular development and delivery of programs and processes. The other reason I, I wanna talk about evaluation in this way is that as a data-driven di process, it's really um, a way to uncloud our views. It helps us dispose of biases that we might have. Um, it provides you know, this other perspective that if we didn't examine, might lead us to continue to provide you know, some kind of an experience that we think is best for our, our guests and our audiences, but somehow falls short in a way, or misses a big opportunity for even greater impact, or in the worst case, I guess, provides results that are the opposite of what we think we're trying to do. And in the conservation education strategy, chapter eight explains some approaches and methods for evaluation. So you definitely wanna review that section, but in a nutshell, here's kind of what we're trying to understand about our visitors and how we can do it. There's three basic categories that I think about it as. We can watch them doing things, we can ask them questions, and we can test their knowledge and skills, right? Now, before you get into choosing the method, of course, you're gonna to need to have a very clear evaluation question or set of questions. Don't skip that step. Please put a lot of time into the beginning of that process so that you know what is it you're trying to find out and why do you care about that? Because otherwise, we're right back to slide one with a bunch of useless evaluation words and data and your time wasted. So once you have that clear research question, you get the fun part of picking the method and designing the tool. In this first bucket, what, what I call watch them, this is looking for behaviors that visitors might be doing to help answer your evaluation question. And some specific methods for observing visitors would be things like timing and tracking, um, using observational rubrics, um, potentially doing a video analysis or, or observing their use of prototypes. For those of us who are maybe hesitant to approach a visitor with a clipboard, the watch them techniques are a really good fit. Now, at some moment, if, if you are committed to doing evaluation, you will need to talk to your guests. And I'm happy to help teach some easy ways to overcome the fear of, of rejection that goes along with that. But moving on to the second category, asking them. This involves listening for ideas that are gonna help, again, answer your evaluation question. And specific methods that you might put in this bucket would be things like the exit interview, focus groups, visitor intercept surveys, um, maybe dot voting or card sorting. Um, and we don't have time today to get into what it takes to do a really great uh, survey, but you can let me know if you need more support with that. 
And this third category in testing them, this is involved in you know, measuring some kind of change, whether it is the cognitive, the affective, or the behavioral things. Again, helping to answer your evaluation question. Um, here we've got methods like post, pre and post testing or retrospective pre post, um, concept mapping, drawing or journaling, which Monet is going to talk about, probably lots more that you can think of. But just to sort of um, address more specifically what I mentioned about measuring change, this is, of course, the million dollar evaluation question, right? When you are doing evaluation at your institution, you are not always going to be able to demonstrate massive behavioral change, especially from a single uh, participant or a single program. But there are lots of measurable steps along this behavior change journey that can inform your programs or inform a piece of your staffing, maybe change your marketing angles or look at just how you're doing certain experiences within an exhibit. So that single evaluation effort isn't going to prove for us that zoos and aquariums are essential to the field of conservation education. But I think collectively and with really intentionally building on other evaluation projects, we can begin to paint a better picture uh, of the values that these institutions do hold. And speaking of collective effort, chapter eight um, references the ACA's social science research agenda which is a document that lays out kind of a series of broad questions that are worthy of further investigation, we felt, um, to sort of help demonstrate the value of zoos and aquariums. And one of the goals of that research agenda is to promote more collaboration between zoos and aquariums that can each tackle a part of a larger evaluation effort. So that's a very good place to look for inspiration and partners. If you are intrigued and ready to delve into this gift of evaluation a little bit more, you might wanna join, if you're not already there, one of the AZA's um, scientific advisory groups. The, this is a group, any, anyone can join um, online and participate in discussions and have access to this library of resources. I'm a member of the SSRE SAG um, steering committee, and I'm constantly learning new things from these very smart people. Um, if you wish to get additional support from an evaluation consultant, you can certainly get in touch with me um, to talk about either training for your staff or getting help with any stage of the evaluation process. And I bet that the next two speakers are also happy to offer similar support and collaboration on projects. So I will turn it over to Monique. Thanks, Nessie. Um, brilliant presentation. Um, if you are watching um, live, you can now ask Nettie uh, any questions. So use the Q&A box or the chat box to um, any questions, any things that we'd like to kind of ask Nettie uh, at the end of our speaker session. So we're going to move uh, quickly from uh, from California to, to New York and Dr. Monet Vibeki. Um, Monet is the Director of Evaluation at the Institute for Learning Innovation. So the center is, uh, the, uh, is in Portland, Oregon, uh, but Monet is based in Florida, but is now in New York. Uh, so thank you for joining us um, and over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I do do a lot of bouncing around in the United States at the moment, um, but currently calling Florida home. Um, and so I decided to come and just talk about drawings because they're one of my favorite tools. And so when I was talking to Sarah, this is one of the tools that I really enjoy using. And um, I typically find um, really appealing, but overlooked. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about how you can use these today. I've used them in a number of conservation-based um, pro education programs for different purposes, everything from an empathy study uh, with one of the West Coast zoos in the United States um, to my own PhD. And so, what I like about drawings as a tool is, like I said, they're, they're pretty easy to implement with a wide range of people. So we often think of surveys as being um, kind of the Cadillac tool for understanding impact. Uh, that's what I'm asked to develop most often in my work. Um, but truthfully, drawings, especially with young children, um, but not only young children, I've used them with adults, 
um, can really demonstrate changes in thinking, um, especially when it comes to concepts. Concepts are a hard one for many of us to tap, um, and drawings can do that for us. And they're kind of a non, they're non-threatening tool, right? Like at the beginning of a program for the empathy program that we had developed um, out on the West Coast, we just, we just included it as part of the activity for the day. Um, so all the children, as they arrived and sat down, had a piece of paper in front of them that asked them to draw a specific thing. And they sat down and they drew. And then at the end of the day, while they were waiting for the bus, they drew again. Um, it was a great, simple tool for us to collect, and it was just built into the program for the day. Um, and, you know, drawing is a part of science, right? Like many of us for observations and other purposes of animals would draw and include that. So, so it's a very kind of um, accepted tool in what we do. And so I'm just going to give us a brief overview. It's going to look maybe a little intense because I'm going to use some words around content analysis and that. And I imagine some of the those who are watching today have done content analysis of text. Um, but I, what I want to show is that there are kind of three main ways to use drawings and how to analyze them. And it can be very, very quick and easy to do this. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about time and analyzing surveys and the amount of time that might take a drawing with the right tool um, with it to analyze it can be very fast. Um, and so you don't have to spend a lot of time to understand uh, your data and you can understand a little bit of impact quite quickly. Like the, the empathy tool I was just talking about, we were able to that afternoon just sit down with both drawings and do what I'm gonna show you here in a second with content analysis and just do a quick, yep, yep, that's there and understand what impact we had that day. So content analysis is exactly what it sounds like. We're gonna look at the picture and we are going to try to identify some patterns. So for the very first time that you use this, unless you already know what patterns you're looking for, um, you it'll take maybe a little bit of extra time, but in the future, you're just gonna quickly go through and identify those numbers. Um, so I'm gonna show you an example here in a second, um, but it's used to quantify how often something happens and we can actually make some inferences then about um, the words and the things that are happening there. So for instance, it was a project I worked on a couple of years ago. Now this wasn't in a zoo, it's actually in a preschool. Um, and uh, this was given to the preschoolers and their parents, they both did the drawing. Um, and I think this is actually a parent's drawing. Um, what we asked, you know, what, what comes to mind when you think of engineer engineering? And they, they drew what they thought of. And we went through and we created these categories of things that we saw in all of the drawings. And we did that when we collected the very first drawing. So the, the pre-programmed drawings, and we created these categories. And then in the future, all we had to do was apply these categories to the drawings. Um, and we could see the changes that happened over time. As you can see, these are all just themes. So we could see how ideas changed around how often did they draw something around transportation when they were thinking of engineering? Um, and how often do they think of city design? The idea of this program was to expand what people thought of when they thought of engineering. Um, and so we were looking for a bigger differentiation and the types of things, well, there was no right or wrong answer, but were there different types of ideas that came up over time? And we, we had a name on all of the papers. So we were to track this over a long period of time. So that might be one tool that you think of using. And again, this is real easy. We took pictures of everything and we've got it in files so we can pull it up over a long period. And it was also fast and easy for the families and they thought it was kind of fun. Another tool that you can use is rubrics. Rubrics is the one I use most often. Um, and you're setting out standards. We've all used rubrics. We've seen rubrics usually for tests when you were in school. Um, and there are standards that are there um, that you're gonna mark as you go through. They should be detailed. They should lay out what you're thinking of and what your levels are, um, but they can be very complex. So I'm gonna show us two different types of rubrics. One is the easy type. Um, and the easy one, the simple rubric, 
um, this is a good story. So I was working with a young guy um, down in um, Costa Rica who was doing a, a, a program I was helping out with for NAAE. And he wanted to use surveys. It came to me immediately. I was in helping as an evaluation consultant. Everyone had received mini grants um, and had to do evaluation as part of their mini grant cycle. And he said, I'm going to do surveys with all of these children that are participating in this summer camp. And I just asked, why are you using surveys? There's nothing wrong with surveys. I love, I use surveys all the time, but why are you using surveys? What's your, what's your intention? He's like, well, I wanna know how their thinking changes around mangroves. Why not use drawings? And so he did, he used drawings and he found it really easy because they did it the same way they implemented as part of the program. So it was a lot of fun for the kids. It was part of what they did when they showed up each um, week for the camp. And so they actually have multitudes from many ch from children. So they I think have five over the entire time. Um, so they will see changing throughout the program and they're able to see where things might be going wrong in the middle of the program. He said, oh, that was really helpful. I was able to see when kids start drawing something we actually prefer them not think about when they think about mangroves. Um, but these drawings were real easy. And he started with just this simple rubric. Now we developed a more complex rubric because he wanted to go back in and look at them again. Um, but just to understand where they were at, they did a simple rubric of negative, no change, and positive change. Um, and it's just straightforward, easy, and they were able to get some stats about it to also share back to the funder. So, you know, we're seeing 90% of the kids have a positive change. Real easy, real fast forward. And the other type is a complex rubric. This is not the most complex I've developed. The one for my PhD, I think, was the most complex I've ever done. Um, but here you can see there are multiple levels and it is around different categories. So this is a project um, that I was a part of in Britain um, in which we asked young children who were taking part in another informal learning program um, to draw what they thought of when they thought of ancient Romans. And again, we're looking for con um, concept differentiation. So are they getting the ideas correct over time? Um, and so here we used a five point scale and while there's not a lot of detail in what I'm showing you for this five point scale right here, this is the simplest version of what the scale looks like. We actually had very specific things about what it meant between a one and a two, right? So minimals like one or two things are that are kind of wrong, like massive kind of that one is there's lots of things that don't or don't fit in here. Now this isn't a great, this is a decent example of actually some positive change. So this young man was uh, given a four because he actually gets in more detail in here. It's not a big difference, but it's a slight difference. And we were able to then, oh, if my PowerPoint wants to behave, we were able to do some graphs really easily. We put this all in Excel. We were able to do some graphs. And then if you've got somebody who is that statistic nerd that Nettie was talking about, we did some ANOVAs and things on it to actually show the funder even more about like what what was the true impact? But this graph is the thing that most people are in. Oh, this graph is what most people are interested in when they look at this. Um, and I've had lots of questions. We've used this a lot. Um, and it's a sort of thing that makes a nice display. But overall, I just wanted to give a, an introduction to drawings. Like it's very easy. It's um, something that, like I said, I used it with adults and, you know, the adults at first were like, you want us to do what? But then as soon as they get into it, they're talking about their drawing, why they're doing it. I had it kind of a think aloud. So they were talking about their drawing while they're drawing it. And, um, I have an artifact now of their thinking versus trying to make sense of their attitudes and thinking through a survey, which might've been more complex, um, versus what I was able to get from their thinking from a drawing. So um, I, that's, I just want to do a, a quick introduction to that. If anybody's interested in drawings, I'm happy to have, I have a cat rubbing on the screen. Um, if anybody's interested in drawings, I'm happy to talk about that, do more details, show the rubrics. Um, I cut them out of this presentation, what they really look like and how you might develop them. Um, and that's something that, I use frequently in addition to other tools. So I have used these alongside surveys and things and I'm happy to field questions about that. Great, thanks Monet. 
Um, and actually, okay. Nessie and Monet, if you want to put your email and contact details in the chat box, chat. So if, if people do want to kind of follow up, and that's that's one of the ideas for this webinar, so people can kind of um, make contact and have further discussions with our speakers. So yeah, just pop that in the chat. I will. Um, if you've got any questions for uh, Monet, um, Nettie and Andy, then please do either put it in the uh, Q&A box or in the chat. So um, our last speaker, we're going to move from uh, New York over to, uh, to Chester in the UK and to Dr Andy Moss. Andy is uh, a lead conservation scientist with a specialism in social science at Chester Zoo in the UK. So over to you, Andy. Oh, I just muted myself. Um, uh, interesting that uh, Monet's cat um, um, interfered at the end there because my cat is, is sleeping suspiciously quietly next to me. But I'm, 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 if he does make an appearance, then I'll, I'll try and make the best of it. But yeah, um, but because I've, I've been in um, the zoo business, if you like, for so long, Sarah and I talked about maybe um, jotting down some ideas um, of things that I may or may not have learned over the last 20 years. It's 19 years, actually. It's not quite 20 years, but that's long enough. Um, so, and I've only got five slides, so there are only five things. But these are things that come up sort of time and time again when I talk to people about evaluating their work, uh, about education in general and about conservation. Um, so we'll see how we get on, but uh, hopefully this this will resonate with you a little bit. Um, the first one is that I used to be a zoo educator. Um, you know, you'll never unsee that picture. Um, this was taken, um, I don't know what phase I was going through there, but uh, it was a long time ago, so you know there we go. But I was actually a zoo educator, so people who talk to me and they say, "Well, I haven't got time to evaluate my own work." Well, I disagree entirely. Um, it's about prioritizing what you think is important, and I would say, as a professional educator, um, if you don't evaluate your work, then you're not necessarily doing your job completely. Um, and I'll be that blunt about it. I think it's absolutely integral to it. Um, and I'm not suggesting that I, I'm in any way special. I'm certainly not. Um, it's just something that I thought was appropriate uh, at the time. And my organization um, was very, very supportive of that. But uh, just to show you that I did do some evaluation uh, back in those, those times, there's a uh, report I did uh, on a study, a uh, timing and tracking study um, from 2005. And then I published some terrible papers in uh, 2007 uh, and 2008 while I was still working as a, a zoo educator full time. Um, and there is time to do it. Um, you know, school holidays, if you're not um, involved in in-zoo activities, um, you know, if you're not involved in uh, classroom sessions all day long, there are ways of getting around it. So I don't ever take that as an excuse. So there. This is the, the second, uh, second area I, th I think of as important. And I know that those of you who don't have English as a, as a first language, these two words might not um, be very useful or very clear to you about the, the difference between them, but it's basically just doing something. So doing education, um, looking at those happy smiling faces in your classroom or out in the zoo, that isn't the same as achieving what you set out to achieve. So the outputs are simply doing things. So you, you know, how many kids you've taught or how many sessions you've taught, how many people you've talked to out in the zoo, the outcomes are what you have achieved from that. So the example I've got here is uh, Chester Zoo's um, uh, sort of safari ranger in zoo uh, in school program although this is actually a, an in zoo uh, picture um, and you know we've got loads and loads of photographs of great activities in classrooms uh, around our area but on the right we have a measurement of the outcomes from those and that's the difference so don't think by the fact that you can demonstrate lots and lots of happy smiling faces that that is you achieving what you set out to achieve um, I suppose that, well, one example I'll give you is um, a few, you know, a few years ago, it's probably maybe seven, eight years ago, um, we took the decision at Chester Zoo, and I know Charlotte Smith's uh, on, on the call as well, and Charlotte is the Director of Education at Chester Zoo, and we stopped using animals in our 
classroom sessions. And I know that a lot of you use animals, um, live animals. And the reason was that we did a study um, and we found there was no difference in learning outcomes between using animals and not using animals. So we stopped. But the teacher feedback always used to say, wow, the animals are so great. They made such a difference to the kids. Um, they learned so much from the animals. But in actual fact, they didn't really learn anything additional. So just be aware of that. And then very, very clear, almost the first uh, question that I ask people when they talk to me about evaluation is they'll often say, I want to evaluate the impact of what I'm doing. And I will say, what do you mean by that? And it's the most annoying question in the world to them, I think. And it's like, I need to know as a researcher, I need to know the specific things you want to find out from your participants. Um, and uh, as a nod to Sarah, who has been banging on about having an education plan for, again, 20 years, um, that it is really, really important to have that. So you know already what you want to achieve um, as part of your education program. So is it knowledge or attitudes or, you know, connecting people to nature or the sort of more complex issues around changing behavior um, need to be very, very clear about what you're trying to achieve so we can evaluate it carefully. And then this is the big thing for me. I've, I've to, I can see a cat behind Sarah. I knew a cat would uh, make an appearance at some point. Um, but yeah, the big thing for me is that so many educators don't see their work as conservation. That seems madness to me, absolute madness. The work that we do in zoos, the conservation education that we do is absolutely integral to the conservation role of zoos. And in fact, I would go even further than that. And I would say that the educational aspects of zoos are the strongest form of conservation that zoos um, actually achieve globally. Um, and you see this, this paper that I worked on for a few years ago, where we, we, we showed that the educational value of zoos actually helps achieve global biodiversity targets. That's kind of cool. Um, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that, and I'm in any way special for doing this. It's just a thing that zoos do, and it's good. Never underestimate the power of the educational work that you do. Um, it is absolutely superb. And then the last thing I would just say, after being probably slightly negative, um, but I am quite old and I am quite grumpy, and it's 7.30 here in the UK, so, you know, getting a bit tired, um, is that you can do this. It's absolutely possible. Um, and I'll leave you in it with a rather geeky uh, model, which is the um, COMB model of behaviour change. And I would just ask you to look at the, uh, the three um, inputs on the left and ask yourself honestly if you need assistance with capability um, or the opportunity to conduct evaluation research or whether it's your motivation to do so. And more often than not, it's the motivation which is needed. Um, there is lots and lots of um, sources of uh, training and help from people like myself and obviously uh, Mane and Nettie and others who are more than willing to help you out. The opportunity may be difficult sometimes, I guess, in terms of time, but as I've said before, it is workable. Um, so ask yourself an honest question and whether it's your motivation that's holding you back. Um, and it's it's a fair thing. It's absolutely, you've got a lot of things on your plate, but I do think you can do this and I do think we can all do this. Okay, rant over. I'll finish there. Great, thanks, Andy. I think there is a, a, a theme of cats um, in this <laughs> in this webinar. Um, so we've had three fantastic speakers. Um, now is your opportunity to, to ask them questions um, for the next around 15 minutes. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is we, we've got a couple of questions uh, in our Q&A box. Um, uh, what, um, one is for Andy about reading the, the study about using animals um, in sessions. And so um, is there a place where, you know, you talked to, about a number of papers that you've written. Um, do you want to either un answer that now or put the, the link in the chat? I, I was kind of doing both at the same time. Oh. And I'm, I will, um, with that animal study, I will have to dig it out from my awful filing system. But I will. Um, uh, and I, I will send it across. Excellent. It might not be now. Because <laughs> it's late for you. 
Um, okay, and then um, we'll move to uh, another question. Um, uh, and this is from Stephen Willard. Um, it says, any tips for collecting evidence of outcomes, not outputs on conservation for general zoo visitors rather than schools? So um, that's a, one for everybody to think about. Um, maybe Nettie, if we come to you first. Um, so the question was around collecting evidence of outcomes, not outputs um, on conservation for general zoo visitors. So not that kind of school audience that we often think about. Sure, and, and I wonder if this question sort of stems from the sense that we don't always have clear outcomes written out for the general zoo visitor in the same way that we might for an education program that we're delivering to a school. Um, so maybe that's where you start is what are what are your outcomes for your general visitors and it might be you know specific to a particular exhibit, or it could be the whole zoo or aquarium experience, I suppose. Um, they, they, they might look, you know. A little bit mushy um but if you can articulate those then i think you can then look okay but what part of that are are we interested in really gleaning uh from an evaluation effort and, and maybe that helps i don't know monet or andy other thoughts well i think you're on the right track many right like with the outcomes is the biggest and often hardest part because our outcomes usually actually for the general visitor our community start quite big we often think big um and so one project i'm working on right now in the united states is really trying to think a little bit smaller like what are the things that we maybe want to see there's uh we're working towards zoo community partnerships um and what does that look like what are the outcomes of that and it may not automatically be behavior change i know many of us jump automatically to behavior change it might be some attitude shifts or a difference in who attends for that particular program um so visitation rates of different parts of the community so we, let's think about our outcomes on that that finer level probably first which is often what we do with schools we're thinking we're not thinking that we want children to automatically step into science careers we're we're looking at aspirations towards science careers so thinking also similarly for our, our visitor level and then matching up all those tools Nettie talked about so not just automatically going out and being like okay i'm going to survey everybody who comes to the music or to the zoo like that's probably not going to serve you well um, it needs, they need to match. You need to match up the things that, that are, you're trying to achieve and it doesn't have to be outcome based, um, in the same way or output based in the same way you're thinking of like maybe an event or a new exhibit, it could be different. Great. Um, Andy, anything to add? Um, just, just, uh, well, just to echo those, those comments from Monet and, and Nettie there, but also, um, for Stephen, it's like, you know, uh, thinking about the scale of, um, what you're trying to to explore here. So is it, you know, we're talking about the evidence of outcomes of whole zoo visits or from very specific areas within the zoo, even a particular sign. So that the sort of scale of that, and obviously it's much easier to do at a smaller scale. Um, having had experience of doing sort of whole visit type studies being quite painful and took years off my life, then uh, I would recommend starting small. Great. And, and that really, there is a, another question that I know Nettie was answering in the Q&A box, which talks about how do you narrow down what you want to learn from evaluation? And I think what you guys have said is that it's really thinking about the other end, the front end, which is what are the outcomes? What, are, what is the purpose of, of your programme or your, you know, your whole visit? Um, and that's one of the, the things that I know that uh, many of us talk about is the value of a conservation education plan, a really good idea of the roadmap that you want to kind of follow because if you you know if somebody says hey we want to evaluate this new exhibit well what was the purpose of this new exhibit and so it's really thinking that kind of um that kind of project cycle that goes around between kind of outcomes and evaluation um i guess we'll we'll, we'll go to some other questions and um one of the things that i know that maybe the viewers are thinking about is what are what are your top tips for embedding evaluation um into your into your practice so i know Andy, you were saying you know you were doing it as as an educator what are the things that you would recommend to people if they want to start on that journey to start to start embedding it into their practice um are there any things that you found useful um at, at those early stages 
Well, it is a long time ago, but um, so I can try to remember it. I think there was a bit of perseverance there. I think there was a bit of, um, I'm going to continue doing this anyway, because there may well be some um, pullback from others. And there have been occasions in the distance past where I've presented certain things and they weren't just, they simply weren't believed, for instance. So it was either a case that I didn't know what I was, was doing or I was lying. So there, there may be some difficult times. So there's a case of persevering with that if your organization is only just starting on this journey. But it's very, very rewarding when you get to it, when you've got an organization now which is, is you know, seemingly built around the human outcomes that it can deliver. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, can I can you come back to me in case in case Monet sure, and Nettie yeah. doesn't? Yeah, let, let me have let a think. Let's go to um, for her thoughts. Well, one of the things that I that I've worked on with some institutions is actually creating what we would call an evaluation strategic plan. Um, and you can either, I guess, have that separate from your education plan, or or and then layer them, or or do it together. Um, but I think one of the things, wh whatever you want to call that document, that it should definitely include is some kind of an um, an objective, let's call it, around creating a cultural evaluation for the institution, um, which is, again, super jargony. So you have to think about, okay, what, what does that mean? What does it look like to have a culture of evaluation for us? And then put structures in place that allow that culture to emerge. Nice. And uh, chapter one of the, the conservation education strategy talks about building a culture of conservation education. And it has the elements of it's got to be from CEO keepers, you know, across and up and down. And so I guess it's the same for evaluation because we need that senior level to buy into the fact that evaluation is a need to have, it is important and it is a part of, of who we are as, as using aquariums. Um, Monet, anything to add before we return to, to I was just going to echo Nettie and that I'm working with a botanical center in Miami and we're doing the same thing. We're developing an evaluation uh, strategic plan that's part of the education strategic plan and as part of that we're also giving training so that they develop train the trainer model and so what we mean by that is I don't want to work with just one person in your institution and then you leave if it becomes embedded in the department it just becomes second nature so I know when when I've worked in that way then it's automatic oh how are we going to Med, like how are we going to think about evaluating this piece like it's it's not even a thing you're thinking of at the end as external Nettie's external as well the thing um that's the hardest as an external person is when someone invites us in at the end and says oh now we want to evaluate this and then we're often our hands are tied yeah. on being able to do too much great comments um Andy I think it's, it's, it's it has been the case in the past where that's happened to me internally as well. It's like, hey, we did this thing. You want to tell us that we did a good job? Um, so that's a that's a difficult one. I would just I just add that the, the sort of culture of evaluation, which I really love, that is it's not just uh, with um, educational work of zoos. It's with everything because nobody really likes being evaluated. So and nobody really likes being told that what they're doing isn't great. Um, so that is a difficult one to shift. So that's why I mentioned the sort of perseverance here. You've got to break that down. You know, you've got to make people um, understand that this is important um, and it is a difficult one. But yeah, the, nobody really likes it. Uh, I get that totally. Yeah. Great. Um, we're going to, I think connected to that is um, uh, one of the things in the, the chapter talks about um, that zoos and aquariums are real world contexts. And so it's quite, you know, messy to research and evaluate in, in these real world environments. You know, we, we can't have treatment groups and we can't necessarily, we're not working in a lab. And so it talks about having the, a rigorous yet pragmatic approach to research and evaluation. And so I, I guess um, thinking about um, in your experience, what that looks like or any kind of ways that people can start thinking about how they might kind of research and evaluate in these real world contexts. Um, Monet, I mean, you work with lots of different organizations and lots of different places. And so, you know, thinking about how you key into that kind of the different contexts and how you approach um, the research and evaluation work that you do, maybe we can come to you first. Yeah, um, I think, you know, the last two years have highlighted what we try to think of most when we're doing this type of work is 
it's the flexibility. So we set out with good intentions, right? We set out in the way that we're talking about with coming up with our plan of having it be as rigorous as possible and embedded in good practices, the things that we know that bringing in that theory. Um, but at the end of the day, I think all of us have been practitioners. We know things don't always go to plan and COVID-19 has really made that fun. Um, so I've been working with the national parks in the United States for a few years, and we really had to change in the last two years. And I think it's being open to that, knowing that like with all best intentions, we're gonna try to keep that theory, Pete. We're gonna try to maintain that rigor, but sometimes you just have to bend. And, and um, that would be my advice for people is to don't get so hung up that it has to be exactly as how you read it in some paper that then you don't do anything. Um, because that's what usually happens is then nobody does anything because, well, I can't do it as well as someone says I should. Um, and so maintain that flexibility. And that's something we work really hard towards. So that would be my advice. Great. Thanks, Mane. Uh, anything to add, Betty or Andy, or shall we move on? Uh, yeah, I, I really liked what Monet was saying. Um, my brain went in a slightly different direction when you first asked the question to sort of thinking about with the rigor piece, I always uh, encourage people to really think through what are you going to do with your data once you've collected it? So like before you get a single data point collected, think through what are you going to do with this potential mess? Um, and, and if you can answer that around your super clear evaluation question that you've already uh, designed, then you can be more rigorous around maybe a more narrow set of questions and, and have it be more practically applicable at the end of the day. Thanks. Um, Andy, anything to add? Or I'm gonna to come to you about stats because um, there was a question in the in the chat about, um, that, do I need to learn stats? Um, I already answered it. I, I'm you like... did, but I think it's, it's something that we, we can, you know, I think we're, you know, the last bit we've got about, um, you know, six or seven minutes left. But thinking about what kind of tools um, that people might um, need, um, and so things like statistics, and uh, it says that you're going to run a course around that. So, do you want to talk a bit more about that, and also any other things that you would recommend in terms of reading or resources or courses or things that people can um, start getting on with? Yep, um, I would say reading um, papers um, is, is is really really useful, and these days it's really really easy to get it free if you don't work at a university where they have library access. So or, um, like places like ResearchGate, you can join, or I can invite you if you want, um, and you can join there. And almost everybody will uh, as either shares their, uh, their published work or they will be happy to provide it if you just send them a quick message. In terms of statistics, yeah, I think there is a definite need that there are skills that you will need to be able to evaluate um, effectively in terms of quantitative analysis. Um, we realize that in the EASA community, and we are going to do a series of statistics training courses next year, if anybody's interested, starting at a very, very um, sort of like starter level. And then maybe for those who've got a bit more experience or they remember, kind of remember some stuff they did at university, and we will be using sort of free to use uh, software, which is it's based on the R programming language, but it has a very nice interface over the top. So you don't need to use coding, uh, which is often very, very scary um, for people who are just starting out. So, yeah, that certainly it, it is. There are skills that you need to know uh, and, and the, there's no getting around that. So you've got to take the plunge and and get stuck in there. Can I offer just a, and I'm speaking as the non PhD on the screen. So I'm envious, of course, and I'm gonna sign up for your class. Um, but I also feel like, so I don't disagree at all with what you just said, but I don't want people to hang up thinking, oh crap, I can't do it. I didn't, I didn't earn, earn a degree in statistics. So sort of just to counterbalance with don't, don't run away in fear. There's lots you can learn and, legitimately say about uh, the results of a, an evaluation 
without doing high level statistics, right? It, you might not be publishing your paper in a journal, but if it's really just for your internal purposes and, and improving your own programs, um, I don't know that you always need to do, you know, a, a whole lot with that. You, you have to understand what, again, what are you going to do with your data set? Um, and if it requires a statistical analysis, then, then get help with that if you don't know how to do that. Um, yeah, I, I will stop rambling about that. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, and and that you know, it is really trying to support our communities. There are there's lots of different ways that you know you might want to start moving along the journey of research and evaluation. So yeah, doing a course on statistics, reading reading some more journal articles, starting thinking of the way that what kind of evidence do you, does your zoo and aquarium have? Whether it is children's drawings or is feedback letters or questionnaires even just starting to have a, a bit of an audit of, of where you're at with those four recommendations. That's what we're really trying to support with our, our community. But, um, uh, and this is where, you know, hopefully these webinars are, are useful. Um, Monet, any other kind of recommendations for, for, for things to get people um, for moving along that journey, whether it is a course or some kind of reading resources that you would recommend to our viewers? So I, Nettie and I both belong, um, to the United States Visitor Studies Association, which are open to anyone internationally. Um, it just most of the members are in the United States, but there's a lot of free resources there. We have the Facebook group that shares a lot of things. You can find us there. It's called Zayfig. Um, that's one that I like. Uh, to both Annie and Nettie's point, I tend to sit somewhere in the middle, um, and there are resources that we could probably share around at least getting started simply with sharing your data doing something with it um, and they are available in all these places that we've shared today so maybe there's something we can do there about making sure that they are available yeah uh, and when i if you uh, yeah. whether you can just i'll drop in the yeah. names in the chat so people can uh, um, look at them so yeah, it, visitor studies uh, organizations, um, there are a number of different kind of Facebook groups. Um, if you're not part of the um, IZD um, Facebook page uh, like that, because they do share kind of research studies, the same with the EASA Conservation Education Facebook group, there's a number of different papers that we do try and share to make sure that you don't have to kind of keep up with the literature. Um, in terms of, uh, we're, we're nearly at the hour. Um, and so I'm just gonna come to our speakers for one last time in terms of, closing uh, you know um if you are thinking of our viewers and and they are trying to get on those you know further themselves in the research and evaluation space what kind of advice would you give them to just kind of um keep going and and take that, those next steps so um Nettie, if we come to you first so thinking about those next steps for our viewers um what are your top tips oh top tips okay i was gonna say i'm sorry i missed the question because i was putting things in the chat box um oh, yeah it's okay um just well, a closing thing to kind of uh, round us off. Any sure. any thoughts? That we sure. Covered? Yeah. I mean, think about what your what your department really needs, and and try to prioritize that. You're not going to evaluate everything, and and don't you shouldn't. That's horrible. Um, you know, t tap into existing resources, connect with others, um, and and consider an, a consultant when you need one. Budget budget for that. It, it can take a huge load off of your plate and give you a lot to work with. Um, after the fact. Great, thank you. Uh, Monet, any closing uh, thoughts First, I would say just get out and try. So just try things. Um, that's often, it'll build confidence in the team and that. So just get out and at least try things. Um, and then take advantage of all these different groups. They offer a lot of free resources. I mean, there's some paid things, but there's a lot of free resources out there. And then, um, yeah, connect with others, network with people, whether that's through other zoos and doing shared learning or with some kind of external person who can maybe help you just maybe take it to that next level. Um, but we know that you don't always have a budget for that, but at least, you know, think about it. Yeah, great. And then uh, Andy? Yeah, all of that. Yeah, that was good. No, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a case of, if you're not evaluating your work, be honest with the reasons why. If it's a capability issue, get it sorted. It's, it is possible. Um, and you just have to really, like, like Monet says, you've just got to really just give it a go uh, and see how you get on. It's not as difficult as you think. Great. So uh, we'll stop there with our kind of uh, discussions because we're, we're nearly out of time. Um, 
This has been brilliant. Hopefully our viewers have found it really useful. I can see that there's lots of uh, different links in the chat that we're, we're, we've put out there. So some things for you to follow up. Um, Kim, we've got a final poll to wrap us up. Um, so this is just a couple of questions asking you how valuable did you find this webinar with your journey uh, with the conservation education strategy? Um, so have a, a think about where you'd like to pop your tick. And then the second question, uh, what would you like to see in future webinars around the conservation education strategy? So this is the last one in the, the 2021 series, but we're hoping to do more next year. Um, but we really do need to, to look, like hear from you about what you'd like to, to have. Does this format work or would you like some you know, different kind of activities in our webinars? So, Kim, once we've got a good response rate, we'll see where we're at. Right, I'm going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so um, you can see from the results uh, on the screen um, that we've got uh, every, you know, 50% very valuable, 30% extremely valuable. Um, and I've really enjoyed this discussion with our, our speakers, learning more about the, the, the different perspectives of, of research and evaluation. Um, if we look at the second question, um, you know, keep the same mix as this webinar, which is about 60 percent of you said that. Um, and it's great to hear that <laughs> over eight webinars, we've kind of got the mix right about where we're at. Um, with this kind of content. So again, I'd just like to thank um, Nettie, Monet and Andy. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your kind of presentations. It's been fantastic. Um, for the viewers, uh, either watching on live or watching later, do um, check out our IZD YouTube channel where this will be recorded. Um, and then hopefully we'll have new webinars into 2022. So uh, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll hope to see you soon.